price that would have prevailed, counterfactual price that would have prevailed um, in these cases, and, and to think whether that would be relatively easy to do um, uh, in, in during the COVID-19 um, period. So uh, you'll see it's, a, it's the first, first draft, probably a lot of errors, just trying to think through it. The, the, the basic structure is to uh, is to um, lay out the regulations and try to give them a little bit of economic content and then to use simple econometric uh, formulations, uh, time series based formulations to show how, what are the different types of benchmarks that one could think of and, and, and then to identify the problems associated or the remaining problems, even if one actually does settle on a particular benchmark. So um, I want to start, um, let me just see, uh, by just looking at, um, as I said, um, maybe just giving a quick overview of, of what the regulations entail. Um, and these regulations define, uh, of course, are in relation to the national disaster, um, COVID disaster. They, uh, they lean on different parts of, 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 of other legislation um, including uh, the Disaster Management Act, the Consumer uh, uh, Protection Act, and things like that. Um, and so they argue or, or they define an excessive price increase as a price increase that does not correspond to increases in cost um, uh, or results in an increased markup uh, relative to the average markup that was achieved in the three month period prior to the start of the disaster period, which is the 1st of March. And so um, uh, there are legal questions whether you should think of both simultaneously or not. I think of them as, 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 as both being a condition for, for a joint condition for uh, excessive pricing. Um, as I will argue that, that uh, especially when you read it to, uh, the first with, together with the second, then uh, it is not just cost that should matter, but also demand at least um, uh, normal demand, and I'll define normal, uh, when, when evaluating uh, behavior of prices during, a, during the disaster period. So that's the regulations define a, a price increase. So it is also a slightly different, the formulation, the act is simply that there's uh, the conditions for determining a competitive price in an excessive pricing investigation. And this focuses simply on a price increase, it already denotes a concern, a short-term concern rather than uh, the typical long run concerns in, in excessive pricing, uh, where the focus is on sustained pricing uh, behavior. So that's the different, those are the different definitions. Um, and, and in these kinds of cases, of course, uh, excessive pricing is not prosecuted in the, uh, at least defined broadly, uh, in, in its usual in its usual form is not prosecuted in the, in the US. So the US allows monopoly pricing um, in terms of the Sherman Act, so it's not prosecuted under Section 2 of the Sherman Act, but it is uh, prosecuted or it could be prosecuted in the, in the European uh, Union and certainly um, the South African Act also allows for that. So it is, it's a question that, is, that has received some attention internationally and so it is useful to think about how exactly these new regulations fit into, into the broader, uh, into the broader um, uh, policy towards excessive pricing. Um, now, the process typically followed when evaluating these cases could be described as a three-stage process. Firstly, and the one that I'm going to focus on is benchmark, benchmarking, the um, finding some kind of a benchmark for, for competitive prices, uh, for the price, so a competitive benchmark. Um, and then, of course, the legal process then would, would, would determine the extent to which uh, um, authorities are willing to, uh, to accept a deviation from that benchmark. Um, and then whether there's some form of an efficiency defense, um, which is often related in these, in these typical, in the conventional cases related to the fact that there might be investments required um, or uh, that investment might flow from, from, from allowing firms for, to, to, charge, um, to charge monopoly pricing. So um, one might argue, and, and I, I deal with some of these other dimensions in the paper as well, and I won't focus on them today, but of course one could argue that some of these concerns probably fall away under current conditions. So the concern might well be that, um, you know, higher prices uh, in, in, uh, during the disaster period is not necessarily going to give rise to, to investment. Um, but at the same time, 
there is also the the more general concern that about constraining of course constraining the uh, uh, price increases in the face of demand surges um, constrains the functioning of, of the market economy and the sig sending of, of signals that, that allocate resources um, and I think that's that's a core concern um, uh, when once you trying to do these kinds of things with competition um, competition policy so I'm going to focus on the first on the first one just um, give you my initial thinking and then you can tell me what you think uh, how how to think of benchmark prices in in the in these cases so let me just get uh, get into it um i think the uh, the typical uh, approach well you, to finding a benchmark price can be classified into approaches that look at at cost as i said cost based approaches um which require uh, often the inputs from accountants and others to to find an actual cost and then to argue about the appropriate profit margins to get to some kind of an ideal price uh, um, that would have prevailed uh, in, in, this, uh, in, the, in the market and the investigation. Um, that is the typical approach in, in South African uh, competition cases. Um, uh, there's a very a good summary of that in, 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 in Rina Disney and, and, and Pamela. And Pamela Mundliwa's uh, a summary, a recent yeah. summary of yeah. three years ago. Um, uh, so, so they've they've looked at this, and of course, it raises a number of, of questions, um, uh, which which I won't go into into now into into now. Um, but of course, there are also a set of other approaches to finding benchmark prices. And if you look at the Competition Act that has been amended. Um, what they have tried to do in the excessive pricing um, uh, section is to uh, is to try and specify a variety of factors, some of which might be interpreted as supporting a cost based approach and some of which might indicate a, a preference for a comparative based approach. The idea of course is not necessarily that these two approaches are are um, are, are could, could produce conflicting uh, uh, prices. The idea is that they're all aimed to giving us some kind of a competitive benchmark. But even so, um, the second set of uh, approaches is the, these com so-called comparator approaches, which says, well, um, don't do it from the bottom up. Uh, look at um, the behavior of other firms in the market and investigation. Look at the behavior of the same firm in other markets. Look at other regions. Um, and so, so this kind of comparator approach uh, then requires so so so, so grant, uh, conditional on being able to control for cost differences, for demand differences, for other structural differences. Then one could, uh, in a typical diff and diff way, if you want, uh, difference and difference way, uh, econometrics, uh, econometrically speaking, find uh, or identify the uh, impact on of of a change in competitive conditions on on the. Um, on, on pricing, so so these other option, uh, other uh, other regions, other markets, other firms may well provide one with these um, um, uh, benchmarks. Problem there, of course, is there are many idiosyncratic features that is often difficult to control for, and so um, in these kind of cases, um, uh, it may well uh, be preferable. Uh, to to look to the um, to the market to the firm and to the market in being investigated its own past and its own history of, of, of price setting to try and and find a competitive price now in South Africa that kind of approach where we look at the at the at the own past history or the own past of the of the firm's uh, uh, and, and the firm's behavior is is uh, has been difficult because, of course, many many markets the uh, anti-competitive behavior might have been persistent for a number of years. So it's often difficult to find a benchmark uh, period, and so uh, this is probably one of the reasons why uh, these kinds of approaches have not really been um, uh, gained gained much ground. And of course, um, even so, if, if it is possible. Um, if, if it is the case that one could somehow um, uh, uh, find a structural shift uh, to have occurred in the market, and, and, and David Gilo, uh, well-known Israeli um, IO economist, uh, argues, for example, for the use of entry 
as, as something that disrupts the competitive conditions in the market and therefore um, uh, provides uh, some kind of a comparator or delineates uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the time, could delineate the time series into a period uh, with, with, with more and a period with less competition. Um, and, and these kinds of structural shifts and, and could, could be useful. Now, of course, as I said, in some of these, historically, in many of the South African cases, this is not so easy to get. But potentially, um, if one uh, if looks at the COVID-19 uh, regulations, one might say, well, maybe the argument there is that, that this retrospective benchmark might actually be, um, be quite useful. Um, if, uh, if we think of the disaster period as, as bringing a structural shift in competitive conditions, and, and uh, I look at a number of, of arguments in the paper and, and why that could be the case, then you could say, well, I have actually a proper delinear, a proper uh, uh, comparative period, and I would be able to match um, the uh, disaster period with, with some, with, with, with um, uniquely with, with um, uh, uh, excessive pricing behavior. I would be able to identify that um, uniquely. So that's the, um, that seems to me, uh, that's maybe not what they, what they were thinking about, but that seems from an economics perspective, I think that would be um, the most appropriate way of finding a competitive uh, benchmark price in the current conditions. Of course, um, what is different in these regulations is they are referring to a specific period. They're saying three months and uh, before the start of the disaster period, that should be your reference period. And of course, there's no reason. I think that is that is that is probably misguided. I think there's no reason you should you should in, uh, in any case um, look at, at only three months past history. And I look at that a little bit in the paper as well. I think the, the point will be to measure demand and costs uh, behavior and the dynamic response of price properly, and that will require a sufficient history. But I think um, the main point being that that the um, disaster period. Um, uh, delineates or, or creates some kind of a competitive uh, disruption in terms of competitive conditions is important. It's also important because it would actually um, kind of limit uh, the extent to which the Competition Commission might be able to apply these regulations. So, I mean, there are many situations where potentially uh, you would have to say, well, have, have com competitive conditions really changed that much? Um, under those conditions, you would need to be clear on why you think the incentives now are different uh, for, for, uh, for anti-competitive behavior compared to what they were before. Uh, and, and these, of course, all relate to the extent of the market and, and the assessment of market power. I don't want to go in that direction and now just focus on the, on the benchmark prices. But I think that is that's really the, um, the, the entire, um, the successful, measurement uh, of a competitive price using a retrospective benchmark depends critically on, 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 on really justifying that there is a structural shift uh, in the market. I think that is one of the key things that, that has, to be, has to be done. Um, so uh, if, you, if you think about what these regulations um, uh, are doing, is they're saying uh, you, you, uh, a, a competitive price is a price that should respond to cost, and uh, I, in, the, in the way that it has always responded. And a competitive price is a price that does not, uh, a price change that does not change the profit margin. So that would mean uh, they would also allow for some, some demand um, response because if the firm had responded in a certain way in the pre-disaster period, which is now supposedly the more competitive period, then, uh, and it responded to the same type of demand uh, in the disaster period, then of course profit margins would have been unchanged. The crux, of course, of the matter is that demand has not changed, and so so one can infer that the, that the issue really is with demand and with excess demand, if you want to call it that, the extent to which demand um, deviates from from uh, from its normal path. So so so, uh, and now I'm giving away the paper. <laughs> most of what I'm thinking about is, is uh, the uh, benchmarks that you have in your mind uh, are really uh, some kind of a benchmark where you've controlled for cost, where you've controlled for normal demand, and uh, where you have, but where you are kind of uh, not willing uh, to allow for, for excess demand. 
Um, and I'll show you a, an example maybe that will make it a little bit clearer. So um, what I do in the paper is I say, say then, okay, so, so all of this sounds terribly uh, close to uh, uh, the excessive pricing regulations. If you read it at face value, it sounds quite a, kind of close to price gouging kind of regulation. And there is a, there is a sense in which the, the authorities um, intend that because the, they have changed, they've, they've tasked the competition uh, authorities to apply not only competition law, but also consumer law um, uh, provisions against unfair pricing during this time. So there is a sense in which you, the regulations are a little bit too faced there. But I, if, you, if one focuses ex, um, but, uh, on the competition um, aspect, then you might ask, but in what sense is, a, is an excessive pricing, um, uh, cons uh, is excessive pricing uh, policy different from price gouging policy? Uh, and which of course we don't have a, there's no reference to price gouging, but in, in particular in the in the regulations. But I mean that's the that is the intent. And so what you you think about how these benchmarks compare. So what I do in the paper is to say, okay, what is the standard excessive pricing benchmark? What is a typical price gouging benchmark? Because of course price gouging laws different uh, differ across different jurisdictions and even in the U.S. across different states. Um, but the point is, um, so what would be a, 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 a reasonable price gouging benchmark? And then where would these COVID-19 regulations fit in? What kind of benchmark uh, do they have in mind? Um, and so what I've done is, is, to, is to start just by saying, okay, what is a standard excessive pricing benchmark if one is going to use a retrospective benchmark? If one is going to say, I know there is a period where there's a structural shift uh, that will allow me to find these um, to identify uh, um, uh, to identify excessive uh, ex excessive pricing. So um, the typical strategy, and this this is this is drawn from um, from a lot of the work that I've done in, in terms of collusion and modeling of collusive damages. And, and in these kinds of cases, the idea is typically to model uh, to to use a reduced form model of price. So having uh, sufficient control for demand and cost drivers in the, in the equation, and then uh, fit that over a pre-disaster period and then a forecast into the disaster period. And then to compare these forecasts. Of course, you could also do this using a dummy variable uh, and then fit the model over both the pre-disaster and the disaster period. I'm not, uh, I mean, they are under certain conditions equivalent and um, I've, I'm, one of my PhD students are looking at, at those at that equivalence under different um, properties of time series, and I'm not going to go into that. So I'm just going to focus on a forecasting approach, fitting uh, the, 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 the model over the pre-disaster period and forecasting into the disaster period. So that's a simple model. You'd, so in this case, it's just a simple uh, a demand driver D and, and cost driver C. Um, just as a practical note, I mean, uh, I think one of the big challenges in these cases, and I think what, what's coming out also in the DISCAM case now that's, on, that's ongoing, is, is measuring the cost uh, and the dynamics of the cost behavior. And also what you do if cost is uncertain, if there's uncertainty in the cost. Anyway, so let's, uh, if, if, if that's the typical model, then you'd forecast using that model. So you take the parameters forecast into the, into the uh, disaster period and then compare these. Um, that, that would be a standard excessive pricing. So its, its main feature is that it controls for both cost and demand. And in fact, so there's, there's great emphasis in the, in the literature. And Mot, Massimo Mota is, is doing a, a late today, is also doing a, a webinar on, on excessive pricing. Um, I, I mean, he's written a lot on this. Um, and, and other um, high profile European scholars on, on exactly um, what what entails excessive so in standard excessive pricing also in south africa the idea is not to punish firms for responding to cost and demand factors but for uh for uh, behavior that is related to changes in competitive conditions um which is um, comes back to gilo's gilo's point um that i've mentioned earlier so that's so 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 you control for them sufficiently uh, and the price gouging um the concern is technically uh, can I interrupt asking a question? Yes. Um, I have a question in relation to the model itself. Uh, so, so is there a uh, theoretical underpinning in the model that you present? I mean, specifically with respect to the lagged 
values of costs and prices. So I would imagine that typically you would have model where, where reduced form depends on costs and demand factors. So what's the purpose of having the lags here? And where do they come from? Um, so the, the theoretical structure of the model is not typically discussed in these, in these kinds of cases. They uh, depend, of course, on partial adjustment behavior and typically on, the, on, on properly modeling the, uh, the observed um, behavior of, of price. Um, and, and, of, and depending on, of course, the mod. So I'm not, so in this case, I'm, I'm using it a little bit differently. So I am gener I'm generating the data as if it follows this process. Um, but of course, it may well be that the, the data generating process might well look quite different. Um, so this is, a, it is an, I'm using an example where I, which I think is, 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 is close enough to how these kinds of, of, of models typically uh, look in the sense that it controls uh, or contains a lagged uh, uh, behavior or uh, controls for lagged behavior in both the demand and the cost variables. I think that is important because of course the, um, I think what's, what's happening at the moment is that, you know, if, if you're observing short term price increases, you need to think about how things work um, uh, dynamically. Um, so uh, structurally, I mean, this is not, I've not derived this from some kind of a model. I'm simply saying, if I wanted to model, uh, if I were given a certain market to understand excessive pricing in that market, what would I do if I wanted to describe the, the observed price in that, in that market? Um, so the, the price gouging benchmark would typically be one that says we are willing to, uh, uh, to, to model, uh, to accept the cost drivers, but we're not willing to accept any demand changes. Um, and so, and this is typically uh, laws that apply after a disaster, hurricane, for example, or an earthquake. Um, uh, there is, uh, there are laws to that that often prevent firms, in many jurisdictions prevent firms from charging prices that are uh, that do not reflect any cost uh, cost base, any cost increases, uh, changes in prices to to in other words to take advantage of a surge in demand for certain goods is, is prohibited in these cases. So if one wanted to do that, um, then you would simply keep demand uh, stable if you want. Uh, we assume no change in demand, and then kind of predict what would be what would be the um, uh, what would be the benchmark price for uh, what would be the appropriate price um, in in the absence of any response to demand. It, so price gouging, of course, has no re relation to market power here. You could be prosecuted as a small firm with uh, with, uh, with no market power simply for, for responding to demand or cost. And I think so, so, so that represents a different type of, uh, a type of benchmark. And the question then becomes, well, yeah, so, so what, where does the COVID-19 benchmark fit in? Um, and, and, and what can we, uh, how could that be actually, how would the policy work to try and um, evaluate um, uh, uh, the extent to which prices exceed the, the, the benchmark? So, I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if you read through the regulations, then it, it would appear that the concern is with abnormal demand. So, if the concern is with abnormal demand in response to price, then we must probably first find some kind of an counterfactual demand. And then you must use that counterfactual demand in your, in your model. Um, that would give you a sense of, of, of where um, costs are going, uh, or where uh, prices should be going if, if, if they behaved um, um, competitively. So um, uh, what one could do is, is say, well, let me let me generate, let me model the demand uh, the demand behavior, and of course one could could and Lucas, just to your earlier point, I mean, one could probably think of different alternative equations. I'm simply using this as this exposition to try and show how this uh, how these different benchmarks would um, would would differ. So um, if you have some kind of a formulation for demand. Um, and and uh, I'll show you a simulation example just now. Um, then uh, I mean, the question is, uh, can I fit that over the the the, the pre-disaster period and predict 
into the disaster period to find some kind of a, a measure of counterfactual demand and use the counterfactual demand to go with the estimates that I've obtained from the pre-disaster period to find um, forecasts that are, let us say, neutral to, the to a demand surge that you, are so, uh, that you are kind of worried about. So that would seem to me, this is what, um, this equation five seems to me what the, what the regulations have in mind. They have, want you to respond to cost, maybe to demand uh, in the way that it should have been, and then uh, somehow then, uh, uh, otherwise uh, uh, limit price, price increases. So what I've done in the paper is to say, if I take these as my, um, as a, assume them as the data generating process, um, assuming uh, um, uh, certain uh, values for the, for the different parameters, then one can generate cases and see what would happen. So I think, for example, Sorry for the for the um, extra error messages there. I just wanted to show you what happens. So I mean, in the typical case, so um, the, the the actual suppose you've got actual price there in 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 black um, that that uh, exceeds um, the uh, response to cost and demand um, that is merited based on the elasticities from the from the pre-disaster period then under conventionally you would be found to have contribute you, you would be found as, as as engaging in excessive pricing so the red um the red uh, uh line there is the is the conventional the conventional uh excessive pricing benchmark and i think there are a number of cases that we've seen in the past uh, few weeks you know where you have price increases of three four hundred percent regardless of other you know other other arguments around the fact that that has happened so, um, I mean, so these cases are probably easier to prosecute because um, I mean even after you've controlled for for the demand surge it's quite possible that that you are still um, in excess of the of the benchmark so um, so then you don't even need to worry too much about how COVID-19 changes the benchmark because you've exceeded the upper benchmark. So in that sense, what I argue is that the, the, excessive, the standard excessive pricing benchmark in red sets a sufficient condition um, uh, in, these, in these kinds of cases. But as I've shown you just now, what the regulations actually contemplate is say, well, um, we don't want you to respond fully to demand um, we would consider it excessive if you responded to, to the abnormal demand in any way. And that's represented by the blue there. Um, uh, and so, so a price that, of course, the, the solid black line still is still it's easy to handle. But if you have a case such as the dashed line there, where you are below the, the um, standard excessive pricing benchmark, but you're above the, um, uh, let's say, the COVID-19 benchmark, then I think you, this, is, this is the area where you're going to run into trouble. And I think this is the kind of area um, that, that you may well find the larger cases to be. Um, so, I mean, if you go to, if, if, if you're going to start prosecuting firms, maybe that increase prices by 30 or 40%, the 500% ones are the easy ones, or the 200%, but the 30, 40 40% ones are going to be more difficult because you're going to, you can may well fall into this into this area in in between. Now, of course, I haven't even put around confidence bands around the red and the blue. I should do that, and of course, in a way that would already tell you that um, it may well be under certain conditions that these are very close to one another. So, one should also overemphasize it. It may well be that it, that these that these two are are close, and in which case it, it 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 would be easier to to do. But I think there may well be cases where the two might be might be somewhat different and, and and then the question is going to be so if you as a as a competition authority find yourself there what um what do you do so 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 um so i've used that that kind of econometric exposition to try and 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 and, and um and and highlight this this particular problem um now i think that the bigger the bigger question is going to be so so if you are in that area between the two benchmarks what are you going to do um, um, so I mean in, in one way by 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 requiring a zero uh, price elasticity of demand with respect to 
a demand surge or abnormal demand, if you want, what you are saying is that um, uh, under competitive conditions, if, 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 if COVID-19 did not hit um, and you faced this uh, a massive demand surge, uh, you would have behaved, you would have started competing very heavily. In fact, you would have competed so heavily that price would have remained would have remained unchanged. And so, this is a very strong assumption about the, the change in competitive uh, behavior or, uh, that, that should be expected when a, a demand shock hits. On the one hand, you can see some of it if you think of the Rottenberg Salander model. Um, uh, which uh, which argues that you know if you have, if, if if firms uh, cooperate or coordinate price in prices, um, well, uh, and and face an unexpected and um, once off sh uh, shock, um, then uh, the incentives to continue coordinating uh, are a little bit undermined because they start competing very heavily for the for the very large um, profit available because of the demand surge. And so, in that sense, one could one could argue that um, uh, there is some there is some support in in that sense. And of course, the empirical literature, the empirical evidence, which is something I'm still uh, looking at uh, in terms of, of, of what happens um, in terms of price gouging, uh, the, the evidence is actually quite uh, quite clear. It's 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 often. Um, most price increases uh, following disasters are, are, are at the end of the day cost based. So you, you may have this demand surge in the first week or so after a disaster, but most of it usually goes back to, um, uh, to, uh, to a cost basis. So, um, so, so maybe you could say, well, so, so competition is sufficient to, to, uh, to, to imply that prices do not, do not change um, as much. Yet, of course, one could also argue the COVID-19 disaster, and we know the rottenberg salina model is, uh, the results of that model is, 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 is upended once you allow for the shocks to be um, correlated. I mean, um, so you could say the COVID-19 disaster is, um, is, uh, is entails not just a single shock, but is a kind of persistent shock. It's a, it's a longer period thing. And in that sense, um, there may well be some basis for arguing that uh, maybe um, uh, maybe price, maybe um, uh, competition might not become so uh, so intense. In which case, it's uh, one cannot really argue that the, that that low uh, lower blue um, uh, benchmark that I've shown you is really the applicable one. Should prop there should be some kind of an adjustment, um, and the adjust it's not clear that the adjustment or the assumption should be very, very um, uh, 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 strenuous competition in the face of, 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 a, of a shock. So it seems to me a case by case evaluation is required. And if that's going to be required, then you are back in the world of having to look to other markets or to other firms. So even though the retrospective benchmark and the, uh, the intention is that you are introducing some kind of retrospective be benchmark here and by, by, by looking at past costs, you're effectively forced to also look at what the other firms and other markets are doing uh, in order to, to infer uh, to what extent uh, competitive conditions um, uh, have, really, have really changed and, 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 and to think about how, except if you have some kind of evidence about how firms have, resp have, have responded to big, big demand shocks in the past. So these are the kinds of things I think that they're going to deal with to try and, 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 and link the demand response and, the, and, and, and competition it is, the, is, the, is the, um, the, big, the big challenge. The uh, just last two minutes maybe, um, um, I mean, the, the whole discussion here is about levels. So what is the appropriate level? Of course, most of excessive pricing is, is not just about level, but about duration, about sustained pricing. And so I think, um, I mean, there are a number of reasons not to prosecute short-term price increases. And I think this can be um, unpacked a little bit further. I haven't done that yet. But the one thing is, of course, um, if, it's, if, the, if it's just a transitory shock, and in order for you to, to know whether it's a transitory shock, you probably need a little bit of time to be able to, um, to do that. Um, uh, in, the, in this case, you could say, well, uh, yes, but, the, but maybe it's not transitory. Because COVID-19, as I just said, is maybe something that, is, uh, that will last for a couple of, of months at least. So the, um, 
the effect might be uh, you, you might have to treat it not as a transitory event as a permanent as a, as a kind of permanent shock and even then um, I, I wonder how you will handle uncertainty as I said before the regressions I've modeled there I mean those are just looking at cost and past cost but um, so they so they assume in a way that, that there's no um, I mean, uh, most of this is based on past behavior in which a certain condition or certain market conditions were given. So if, if things are radically different and uncertain, cost behavior is likely to change. So I think, um, and this is going to be a, a, a problem. So if, if shocks are uncertain, again, you need some time to know to know that. that would, that's why firms, uh, uh, competition authorities typically uh, postpone prosecuting these kinds of price increases. But I think it is. Um, uh, I think that's going to be uh, that's going to be the, the the main challenge. Proving, you know, if you think of many firms, and in fact, if you look at the literature, firms do respond to demand because they're trying to figure out what what is happening. Maybe and they may over respond to demand because they're trying to figure out what's happening in the in the market. And 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 finally, I think as important is. Um, you know, the typical reason not to pursue short-term price increases is because there are just too many of them and maybe your resources are limited. We've seen a massive reallocation of resources within the competition authorities. So a lot of other activities have basically come to a standstill or at much lower levels, but there's lots of focus on this and, and for the sheer number of complaints coming through. Um, and so you could say, well, we've got resources now and they can probably do it. Um, but of course, the problem is still the resources don't necessarily solve um, solve the problem of needing of, of, of having a sufficient time horizon to be able to judge the dynamic behavior of price. Um, I think that's where one of the when, some of the challenges. So this is the uh, the very very brief summary of what I'm busy with. Um, if it is all a little bit um, um, in the clouds, so it is probably is so. I mean, um, but I would love to hear what you think and maybe suggestions on on what um, how to think about it differently. Thank you very much for interesting presentation. Uh, we have some minutes for questions. Anybody wants to raise any questions? Willem, if I, um, it's Johan here. I wonder if I could just ask, um, ask a couple of questions uh, regarding the econometric uh, specifications as well. So uh, I think you hinted, so there's really two issues that um, I was wondering about. You hinted already at um, the fact that uh, controlling for the cost conditions um, is potentially non-trivial in the sense that um, as you enter into a shock of the sort that we've got, um, uh, that, we're, that we're facing right now, the, 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 the entire supply conditions are being disrupted in, in very profound ways too. Uh, supply chains are being disrupted um, and uh, uh, so, and you know, the conditions of the markets that provide the inputs into the industry are all uh, fundamentally subject to change. And so actually capturing those full dynamics are A, very material to how those condition, cost conditions are gonna play out and B, it's actually quite difficult to control for. Um, yeah. So I was wondering whether you had any more thoughts on that and, and, and how to approach that in a systematic and a, a, and a systematic way. And the second question uh, is that, particularly under the, again, under this current circumstances where you're facing such a deep and such a profound shock, um, uh, again, you hinted at the fact that you're facing, in a sense, a structural break in your series. Um, and, uh, and and that's likely to be in all, in all all of your series. And so, what you immediately worry about is that you may have a time uh, instability of the parameterization of the model, so that you know the retrospective application of the econometrics may itself be misleading because you're just not capturing the full impact uh, of the uh, of the structural break. So I was wondering whether. Um, uh, what your thoughts are on that and uh, if you've had any thoughts on it and how you think you might be able to deal with that in any sort of concrete application particularly also the structural break issues because we know it makes huge differences to um uh, to the way in which the system then works um i'll try to answer the second the second most difficult question first which is the the structural break one i think um 
I mean, there, I mean, in general, if you think about the use of, of, of structural um, uh, breaks or modeling of structural breaks in these kinds of, let's call them damages models or over, overcharge or excess price models as they are applied in, 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 in competition policy. I mean, there is always the, there is a, I mean, there is a sense of, uh, one should be left with a little bit of unease about how it's, how it is dealt with. I mean, um, in a way, the assumption is that the structural shift is entirely exogenous, um, and uh, uh, in the case of a cartel, for example, the cartel has broken down. And so the assumption is that maybe, uh, you know, demand, so demand and cost conditions have nothing to say about that. And of course, we know it's not entirely true. We don't know exactly how that happens and why, um, but uh, that, that, the, that somehow demand or cost conditions could play into that is, is, is certainly true. And, and so in fact, in fact, I'm, I'm, I am, um, perpetuating the uh, now or extending the problem now into the excessive pricing um, uh, domain because the the assumption and this is this is the d the difficult thing here, as you say um, as treating this this shift effectively um, it, 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 as in my mind as as, as exogenous um, and and because if you think about a standard uh, collusion model you typically use a dummy variable because you assume you've controlled for everything else. And the dummy variable sufficiently identifies uh, and identifies um, uh, the conduct, and and of course, as you say, the, the, you assume there's stability in the rest of and all of the other parameters. Now, and this is not the case. Um, and this, and, and in this case, the, the 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 added difficulty is you're really relying on demand in a way because your your part of the demand is now acting as the dummy somehow in this or interacting with the dummy. Uh, during this period of, of, of disaster and you're trying to use that to identify the, um, the price effect. So I, I agree with you. I think this, the, at least because you're not doing diff and diff, that's already a, a problem here because I mean, you, you, it's difficult to controlling for that. But um, as you say, the, the, entire, the entire structure might be different. Um, so so I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to get my head around how to, to base do that. I think Probably in this paper, I'll kind of assume this is what what is being done. So not, but but try to point out the um, the, the problem. I think the uh, the first one is even more difficult. How do you how do you control for the for the cost conditions? Um, um, I mean, so of course the point that I've tried to make here is just to, just to show the different benchmarks. And, and of course, in a different approach, could say, well, let's let's have a look at, at what are the different kinds of um, types of cases that could incorrectly attract attention, and and maybe um, and try and see what happens if I um, if I assume the firm's pre predict prediction about expected costs change in, in a way. So so so. Um, I, d I don't know. I must be so, be honest. I think the 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 first one is is more difficult. Um, how to do that? I mean, of course, the, the authorities, in a non econometric way, that of course they they simply go to 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 look at, um, at at documents, internal documents, and and discussions probably going on, having gone on before the price setting, and to kind of infer what happened. But of course, that's I, and that's not that's not the um, the idea with an econometric analysis. So. I, d I don't know yet. Are there any other questions? Uh, maybe I also ask a question. Um, you said that uh, listed as one of the methods benchmarking, which of course would be very difficult because uh, all countries are in this situation right now. So it's hard mm. to find other countries as benchmark. The same when it concerns other industries. Uh, and maybe also with respect to geographic markets. Uh, plus, uh, uh, there's a question, of course, that it happens now. So, uh, in your model, you, you kind of, uh, I mean, I, I, I doubt that proper benchmarking will be possible. So, the alternative is uh, uh, between past and now, as your model suggests. But then, uh, when would be the period that actually will, you will have enough data uh, to be able to compare? Uh, what was before and what was now. And with respect to also what Johannes was asking, uh, so of course, as you mentioned, risk is taken into account by firms and their costs will increase in some cases. 
So your, your, your cost, your, your price setting is also not taking lags, but also maybe future costs mm. into account, uh, which may be also difficult because as you say, we don't know what the cost will be. So just one question, are there, are there any, any markets that right now are candidate markets for screening in South Africa by the Competition Commission, uh, if you are aware of any? Well, um, so what's, what's happening is, um, uh, I don't know if they're actually actively screening. I think they've received so many complaints anyway that they had to work through that first. So they've relied on, on, on consumers bringing the cases to them rather than um, that rather than ex explicitly screen screening different markets, um, um, but of but of course you know what the, the types of cases that are currently in front of the authorities. So I mean the this game case is is, is 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 a very prominent one. There are the face mask, the Babalehi um, face masks case, um, and then uh, the, the the smaller the pharmacy pharmacy Boxburg pharmacy case. So this is the the thing here, and the, what I was saying, you have all these small cases that are really wouldn't attract any attention, um, and then you have. Um, uh, the, the, the kind of properly large firms that would, you know, uh, under conventional you know, requirements actually you know, meet market power thresholds and then would be investigated. So, um, uh, so I, I mean, probably it will be, it will be uh, easier to, to think of this model if you're thinking about how retailers behave, because there you typically have a, you know, a, a very a well-defined wholesale cost and you have a demand driver and so, um, uh, and, 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 and because these retrospective models come from, um, from, from, from the collusion literature, where you often deal with homogenous uh, uh, products um, and, and firms that, uh, um, that have one or two large cost drivers. So that's probably uh, quite important if, um, uh, because of course you're, you know, if, 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 if it's if it's the more complicated is to actually the drive arrive at the firm's uh, at the firm's proper cost structure the more difficult it is to do this kind of modeling as well so it's probably better suited to um to kind of retail level analysis rather than kind of let's say manufacturing level um if you if you know that there's a kind of big driver um of a specific product uh, a wholesale cost driver but i mean there are i think the the there are different um, markets where this is this has been used. So this approach is not necessarily specific to a particular sector. All right. There was also a question here on uh, as a message. Oh, I didn't see that. Does this take into account the fact that some of these items may have fetched dollarized price? Lack of demand internationally have led have led to this to be supplied largely domestically. Sorry, I, I didn't follow that. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, well, does this take into account the fact that some of these items may have fetched dollarized price? Lack of demand internationally have led oh. this to be supplied largely domestically. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, so so if you think about the cost drivers, so you, you may well have uh, you may well have an exchange rate in there as a, as an important driver of the of the cost so i don't think that's a that is a problem that is a problem that you could probably deal with um in in these kinds of models pro properly accounting for the exchange rate um and but of course there you have the same thing as as, as, as both you and Johannes mentioned this this uncertainty how you how you model that if you are very dependent on exchange rate based or import product and you have this huge uncertainty and the rand is going haywire and you have uh, supply chain disruptions, then of course these kinds of uncertainties probably feature very, very um, specifically in your price setting decisions. All right, Th thank you very much for your answers. Is there anybody Sorry. else would like to ask? Yes. I, I hate to, uh, to hog the discussion, uh, no. so I'm very happy to defer to anybody else who wants to, uh, wants to talk. Um, so I'm just wondering whether, um, I mean, you, you're, you're entering into, if you wish, um, such a lot of issues econometrically and trying to untangle this, um, that I'm wondering whether it doesn't make sense actually just to try and get um, a, a handle on it 
by, by, by some different methodologies. And that's really, I mean, you're really doing a little bit of that by doing some of those simulations to see what would happen if um, you saw certain things changing. Um, but to, to embrace the kind of simulation story much more wholeheartedly. And um, I'm afraid I'm, I'm likely to be, you know, like massively out of date on this. But I do know that, um, you know, there are, certainly, there are certainly methodologies available to do, to expand the, the simulation story much more aggressively, to try and capture more of the sort of broader structural forces. And then what you can do within those, within those methodologies is to allow for um, variation across all factors in the model. So you can allow, in your case, it would be variation in the demand, it would be the variation in, this, in, the, in the cost structure. You could allow the structural shock to cause changes in the parameterization of the model. You can allow new factors to, co to come on stream, uh, either permanently or temporarily. And then in effect, what you, what you look at is how the, how the, the outcome variable of interest then is affected by those various factors and to what extent, so that you can actually isolate where the, where the real issues actually lie. I mean, what really, really matters? What do you really need to look at? Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the things which are much less likely to be important. So I know that, so again, I mean, you know, this, this, uh, I, you know, in, in RAND, they, they model, for instance, the very complicated, um, the very complicated supply um, and logistics structures of the U.S. Air Force in exactly that way. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it seems to me that in a way you're facing a similar sort of challenge of trying to isolate, you know, trying to isolate where the thing is. It's just a thought. I don't know if it's possible. And I'm sure, I mean, the last time I looked at that sort of stuff was in the, in the 2000s. And I'm for sure the, the, in a sense, the benchmark methodologies on this has, has advanced significantly. But in a way, it, it means that you move, you move beyond just reliance on econometrics and you actually start you taking seriously the possibility of simulation to see what might be, what yeah. might be driving things. Yeah, no, I think that's a that, that's a good um, suggestion, Johannes. I think the um, it is it is the, it is a problem at the moment. I'm trying to do a lot of things in the in the paper, so I think it might, it might well make sense to kind of split it into different parts and actually just uh, because I've I've tried. Um, this is what I was trying to say. Trying to use the econometrics to to show uh, the the issue to try and um, uh, clarify some of the issues that courts would have to uh, look at even if they are probably not going to do this in an econometric way in, in many of the cases um and so that's probably where the econometric thing start well the uh, with, with this found its its genesis but i think um certainly to try and track how these um which factors are ultimately matter is going to be is, is actually I mean, that's the real point and that helps you to think about whether they're using the appropriate policy policy instrument as well. So, so yes, so sure, this is something to, to think about. Thank you. Um, we are about uh, to finish. Um, if there are no other questions, then I would like to thank uh, Willem for the presentation. Uh, as I said, uh, the recording will be available on the website. I hope you are okay with this. Uh, and the next seminar will be by Prince Shangol from University of Stellenbosch as well, uh, speaking about merger enforcement in South Africa. And as Willem said, actually in one hour, there will be a seminar organized by Center for Competition and Regulation uh, on a related topic on price regulation, and excessive pricing at the times of crisis. So I'm sure that some of you will be keen to participate as well. Otherwise, uh, I would like to thank you again and hope to see you next week at the seminar. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Willem. Thanks, Jan. Thanks.